So, hello everyone, once again, and we're cl slowly creeping towards the end of the book of Daniel. And uh, let's also remember we're slowly creeping towards the coming of Christ. So the important thing is that we're ready for that important time. It's no use thinking, I need to get ready, we need to be ready now. Uh, and uh, if we can get that into our hearts and minds, we'll take things more seriously. You know, God gives a special blessing on those who seek to study and follow the teachings that are in the book of Revelation, right there in the very beginning. And uh, in order to understand the book of Revelation, we first of all have to understand the prophecies of Daniel. So in a sense, God is giving a blessing on those who study these prophecies because the prophecies are focused on these days in which we live. They're not just the last days, they're the last days of the last days, as we said this morning. This is now the time of the end. We're living in the time of the end. And brethren and sisters, we need to be really keen to understand these, these prophecies. So following on from this morning, we're going to have a look at the judgment because we ended this morning by saying that the activities of the little horn in defiling the sanctuary of God, that is, in bringing down the great truths of God's word, is to be restored. God is going to restore that work. And the judgment is a very important work in helping to bring together, as it were, or to identify those who are truly God's people. So, friends, let's not, let's not run away with the false idea that because I'm a member of the church, then I'm saved. Jesus said, there will be many come to me in that day saying, Lord, have we not done this in your name and done that in your name and so on and so forth, and the Lord will turn around and he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And the word that he uses there is the word ginosko in the Greek, which means to know in a very personal, intimate, close relationship. So we need to have that living and meaningful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So this picture on the screen sums up what we said last week concerning the sanctuary being defiled, and with what we said this morning in the activities of that little horn. And remember, the, the pagan ideas, the pagan practices that filtered down from Babylon through Medo-Persia, Greece, and into Rome, into the Roman Empire, eventually filtered into the ecclesiastical realm too, into the church. Because when the Bishop of Rome was plonked on the throne of Caesar by Justinian in 538 A.D., the church was taking on board these pagan ideas in order to compromise and get the, the heathen in as well. And, and, you know, that is not the way to evangelize. It's a system that just creates more havoc and more problems, which history shows. And so, just summing up here, I put some pictures on the screen here just to remind you. The, um, uh, some of these are pictures I would have put in my little excursion that we had to Rome, but we haven't had it in this series because time didn't allow us to do it. But um, you remember last week I showed you on St. John in Lateran is this plaque where it states that the Roman church is the mother church of the world. Uh, and uh, you've got the confessional, the priest confessional, where he tells you what to do. You go and do so many Hail Marys, go and put dry peas in your shoes and all the rest of it. Do your penance and then you'll be forgiven. That's not the way of salvation. Salvation is through the blood of Jesus. As we said this morning, the only way that you and I, the only reason that you and I will be in the kingdom is because Jesus died for us. So let's not forget that. But this is how the sanctuary, the great truths of salvation and of God's word that were portrayed there in that service of the sanctuary, which in itself is a study in its own self. We find those truths have been replaced by false teachings, by, uh, you know, counter-teachings. And that God refers to that in his word as Antichrist. Uh, and then the Sancta Scala, uh, where the penitents go up on their, on their knees saying so many Hail Mays or, or the Lord's Prayer or whatever. 
I'll tell you one quick story. When I was in Rome, my very first visit to Rome, I've been there a few times since, but my first visit to Rome, I was being shown around the city by uh, the minister of our church, who was the official general conference uh, guide for, for the Adventist church in the city of Rome. He, he um, showed me around. His name was Romeo Copes. Uh, or was it Lopez? Copes. But uh, he showed me around, and he took me into the Sancta Scala, which is right opposite the church of, uh, uh, of John in Lateran. And uh, the, the central staircase is what you can see here. This is a picture I took. And you can see the people going up on their knees. Uh, and uh, the priest is at the bottom there. He takes the money. It's like a merry-go-round. You pay and you go up, and you, if, you, if you're really devout, you'll pay again and go up again, uh, and so on. And there's a staircase on each side that when you go up the centre, you then come down the side staircase. Well, we didn't go up the centre one. We went up the side one. We weren't going to go up on our knees. Went up on my feet. And <laughs> as I was walking up there, a man came staggering down that staircase. He was staggering in a very awkward way to get down the stairs. And he walked past, and my guide turned to me, and he said, when this chap was out of earshot, you think he's drunk, don't you? I said, no, I don't think he's drunk. He said, you do? I said, well, yeah, all right. I was thinking I was drunk, but I didn't say anything. He said to me, he's not. He said, he was told that in order to get to heaven, in order to be saved, he had to go up the Sancta Scala three times a day on his knees every day of his life in order to get to heaven. And so that's what he's been doing for the last 30 years. And the only thing it did was cripple him. Friends, that is not the way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. He didn't say the Sancta Scala is the way or your knees are the way. He said, I am the way. And friends, this is what's happened. The great truths have been removed. The sanctuary teaching has been defiled. Again, you go to the Philippines, uh, and here they have the flagellantes. Uh, and uh, once a year at Easter, they, they swallow their Easter eggs, the colored eggs. Uh, the chick is about to be hatched. They swallow the lot, feathers and all, and then they, they, they are, are whipped. Uh, this man here, you can see the blood around his waist where he's been flogged and they carry their cross and they're, they're hung upon the cross for a few hours in order to get salvation and you can go into the room of the relics here there's all these sorts of relics you know Peter's sail from St. Peter's fishing boat a morsel of bread that was eaten at the last supper that's an interesting one a piece of soot from the fiery furnace and, and, and all these silly things pilgrimages that people are making in an effort to get favor with God and enter into the kingdom. And then you look on the other side, the Queen of Heaven, Mary, as she's called now, the Mother of God, uh, the teaching that she was born without a sinful nature uh, and that she is the intercessor between us and Jesus to persuade him to become uh, more favorable. Here we have the statue of of Jupiter. It's been identified by the archaeologist as the statue of Jupiter. It stands there in the Vatican in St. Peter's Cathedral and the initiates come down and they're kissing it and they're rubbing the foot because they think that is the first Pope, Peter. He would turn in his grave if he knew. Idolatry. No wonder the second commandment has been removed from the catechism. And then the veneration of bones and the persecution of the saints. These are some of the things, dear friends, that have defiled and led people into darkness, where they're lost, they're groping for truth, and they weren't even allowed access to the Bible. And the only language they heard the Bible in was a dead language to them, the word Latin. And Martin Luther, when he got his doctorate, he was now allowed to read the Bible. And he opened it, and he said, oh, if only I had a book like this. He didn't realize the Bible consisted of so much. And he put it into the language of his own people, the German language. And that was revolutionized by the 
uh, by the invention of the movable type printing press by John Gutenberg. And the Bible went forward, and when the Bible got into the hands of the people, they began to see the errors, the falsehoods. And they began to turn back to the truth. And many of them were massacred and martyred because they were determined to be true to God's word. Friends, can you see why the sanctuary was spoken of as being defiled? Has it needed cleansing, depending what translation of your Bible you used? And so coming on to the point that we noted this morning, the climactic text in the prophecy of Daniel we stated was Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And let's read the verse before it because it connects here. Daniel said as he was watching the vision, he said, Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the one that spoke, For how long is this vision? concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled. In other words, how long, God, are you going to allow this to take place before you intervene and, and do something to put things right again, to restore the truth and the, the true knowledge of you and the plan of, of God? And the answer came as he was making this prayer. You see, he answered, for 2,300 evenings and mornings. What does an evening and a morning make? A day. Genesis 1, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day, and so on. So for 2,300 evenings and mornings, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored. How long is it going to be, Lord, before you take action on this? After 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be restored. Remember, a prophetic day represents an actual year. Now, friends, Daniel then says in the very next verse, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I tried to understand it. Could you and I understand it without having it help from above? No, of course not. That's why we pray. Pastor Mark prayed with us for the guidance of the Spirit of God. We should always open the Word of God after having asked God to guide us through the Holy Spirit. He said, I tried to understand it. Then someone appeared standing before me having the appearance of a man. And I heard a human voice by the Uli calling, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, help this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I became frightened and I fell prostrate. And he said to me, understand, O mortal, that the vision is for the time of the end. The vision is for the time of the end. So bear that in mind. Now, there are two Hebrew words that we need to understand before we proceed. And I'm going to give you these two words. I'll put them in two different colors so that you'll be able to identify them as we read the passage, okay? The first Hebrew word for vision, translated the vision, we only have that one word in English, vision. But there are two Hebrew words here. The first word is chazon which is referring to the entire vision of Daniel chapter 8. Okay? The entire vision of Daniel chapter 8. The word is chazon. The other word is mare, which refers specifically to the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8, verse 14. Okay? It's important we understand that, because once you understand that, you get a bit more clarity here. So here is the question in verse 13. How long is the vision, the chazon, concerning the regular burned offering? You know, why, when is this going to stop, Lord? You know, how's it going to carry on like this unchecked? So the word is chazon, that's the entire vision. And the answer comes, Gabriel helped this man understand the vision, the mare. So 
So Daniel says, when I had seen the vision, that's the chazon, the entire vision, the message came, Gabriel, help this man understand the vision, that is the 2,300 day section of this prophecy. You, are you with me? Okay, now those two colors, chazon is in pink, more is in red. Now let's come back to the passage. Daniel 8, 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one that spoke, for how long is this vision, the entire vision of chapter 8, Chazon, concerning the regular burned offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled? And he answered him, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be restored to its rightful state. Then we come to verse 15 again. Then when I, Daniel, had seen the Chazon, the vision, the entire vision, I tried to understand it. Then someone appeared standing before me, having the appearance of a man, and I heard a human voice by the Uli calling, Gabriel, help this man understand the Mare, the vision of the 2,300 days. Are you with me? Follow what we're doing? So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I became frightened and fell prostrate. But he said to me, understand, O mortal, that the vision, that's the chazon, the entire vision of chapter 8, is for the time of the end. That's where it's pointing to. Okay? That's why the rest of the book of Daniel is following on from this point. It's to do with the time of the end. That's where we're heading for. Okay? So, then, when the angel comes to explain to Daniel the vision, this is what he says in verses 26 and 27, the vision of the evenings and the mornings that's the 2,300 days, the mare, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? Vision of the evenings and the mornings has been told is true. And he'll show that it's true, he'll prove it, and we'll prove that this afternoon. He says, as for you, seal up the chazon, the entire vision, for it refers to many days from now. You see, at the end of the book of Daniel, God told Daniel to seal it up. It wasn't to be fully understood until the appropriate time at the time of the end. And that was way ahead into the future when Daniel was alive. But what Daniel was given by God was an explanation concerning the 2,300 year period. So he said, seal it up, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And so I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days, and then I arose and went about the king's business but I was dismayed by the vision, that's the 2,300 days, and I did not understand it. Now, before we proceed any further, let's remember, or rather let's note, when did Daniel receive the vision of Daniel chapter 8? Do you remember? I did tell you this morning, and I told you last week, <laughs> in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, King of Babylon. He received the seventh chapter prophecy in the first year. He received the eighth chapter prophecy in the third year, it says, of the reign of King Belshazzar. Here it is. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision, that's a chazon, appeared to me. That's the entire vision. The ram, the he-goat, and the little horn, and so on. And then, <coughs> let's notice, when did the event recorded in chapter 9 take place. Because that's the next chapter. And by the way, chapters and verses were not written in the original. I think you all realize that, don't you? These were added much later. Um, I've forgotten who it was now, but somebody put them in to help with reference, and that, that's a very good aid. When did the event recorded in the next chapter take place? Well, it tells us in chapter 9, verse 1, Daniel is very specific in, in keeping these records up to date. He says, in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus. Now, who was Darius? Was he a Babylonian king? No, he was uh, the Mede, the Median king. You remember, he followed from Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon. And the Medes and the Persians took over, Darius came to the throne. So in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, by birth a Mede, who became king over the realm of the Chaldeans, because now 
Babylon had fallen to the Medes and Persians. So this was taking place um, a few years later. All right, so we, we move on. Let's, let's take it up from verse 2. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah must be fulfilled for the devastation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. You remember Jeremiah the prophet had warned the people of Israel, uh, of Judah, he said, if you continue in your idolatry and, and, and continue your, uh, your uh, he used the term adultery in terms of a relationship with paganism. Uh, and you can see the, the analogy here. And God said it's an abomination what they were doing. They were worshipping Baal, they were offering their children in the fire as a sacrifice to Molech, they were worshipping Ashtaroth uh, and all the other pagan gods around. And God warned them, if you do not turn away, you will go into captivity into Babylon. And you will be gone, he said, for 70 years. Now you can begin to see why Daniel was getting a little bit disturbed about 2,300 prophetic days. Because how long is that in real time? 2,300 years. Remember, a prophetic day represents one literal year. So, let's notice what Jeremiah says here. Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12 this is before the fall of Babylon, uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, sorry. He says, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, how long? Seventy years. Then he says, after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. Because what they were doing was wrong. They would be punished, he says. He says, the land of the Chaldeans will be punished, he says, for their iniquity, says the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. And so God warned that they would be in captivity under Babylonian rule for 70 years. Then Daniel said, I turn to the Lord God, seeking to answer an answer by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. That's a sign of genuine mourning and repentance. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and I made confession. So, you know, I have to admire Daniel. Daniel was not guilty of these atrocious, abominable sins that many of the Jews had committed. He was obviously a loyal man of God. In fact, he was beloved of heaven, as it says. But he was humble enough to identify himself with his people, even as a sinner, because like the rest of us, he was still a sinner. And he sought God's mercy. And in repentance, he's praying for his people that God will not extend this period of their captivity, thinking that sins have been so great, it's going to be extended for another 2,300 years. And so he prayed to God, O oh Lord, in view of all your righteous acts, let your anger and wrath, we pray, turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors, Jerusalem and your people have become a disgrace amongst all our neighbors. Now therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplication. And for your own sake, Lord, let your face shine upon your desolated sanctuary. You know, he's thinking of God's image, isn't he? What will the heathen think around if your sanctuary lays in desolation for so long? He was jealous for God's name to be honored and exalted and to be represented correctly. And we, we also ought to be seeking that to make sure that we do not misrepresent, misrepresent God. We want to honor him in all that we do and say. And so he prays on, incline your ear, O my God, and hear, open your eyes and look at our desolation and the city that bears your name. We do not present our supplications before you on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act and do not delay for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people bear your name. What a prayer, isn't it? You can, you can sense the passion in Daniel's heart as he prays to his God. 
which was recorded in chapter 9 now. You see, this is running on in chapter 8. And then notice what it says. The next verse, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen before in vision, what vision is that? The entire vision, Shazon. He came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. And he came and he said to me, Daniel, I have now come out to give you wisdom and understanding. He says, because at the beginning of your supplications, a word went out and I have come to declare it, for you are greatly beloved, he said. Isn't that a wonderful thing for Daniel to hear? How he heaven regarded Daniel. He was dearly beloved. <clears throat> and so he said, consider the word and understand the vision, the mare. Understand the 2,300 day prophecy. And so he says, <clears throat> verse, uh, the vision, vision then, the mare, the 2,300 days, uh, we've, we've noted, refers specifically to that period of time. And Daniel 8.14 is, is that verse. And the entire vision is Chazon. So he's now focusing in on the 2,300 year prophecy. He's explaining this central text. Daniel 8 verse 14. Here it is. <clears throat> Seventy weeks, he says, are decreed for your people and your holy city. They're decreed for a purpose, notice, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Friends, how is sin put to an end? How is transgression ended? How is iniquity atoned for? How is everlasting righteousness brought in? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. So, during this period of time, this 70-week period, Christ's great sacrifice for us has to take place. Note that. And he says, and to seal both vision, that's the entire vision of Daniel 8, and to anoint a most holy place. You see, in the fulfillment of that 70-week prophecy that we're now going to look at, is the confirmation that the 2300 day prophecy is accurate in its interpretation. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Let's notice what it says. And to seal both vision, confirms the vision, and the prophet who gave it, and to anoint a most holy place. We'll comment on that latter in a moment. Now the word decreed here, the Hebrew word is chapak. And uh, it's the only place in the Bible where that, verse, uh, that word appears in this one solitary verse, Daniel 8, 14. Uh, sorry, <laughs> let me get that. Daniel 9, verse 24. The 70 weeks are decreed. It, it's a word that we, we have to look in post-biblical uh, literature to see how that word was used. And it it's literally appears with the meaning of Cutting it off from something, or cutting something off. It means to cut, or to cut off, to sever. And so therefore, when the prophet says, 70 weeks are decreed, or chathak, they are cut off. From what? From what I'm explaining to you, from the 2,300 years. That, that's what he's saying. So the 70 weeks are to be cut off from the 2,300 day period of prophecy. So how do we understand this? How do we calculate it? Well, let's take it piecemeal. First of all, just remind ourselves, how many days are there in a week? Seven. Thank you. So if we have seven times 70 weeks, how many days is that? Yeah, it's not difficult, is it? It's on the screen in front of you, yeah? <laughs> but I just want you to follow it through. So... 490 prophetic days. What is a prophetic day in interpretation according to the Bible? One, year. One solar year, a literal year as we 
experience it, all right? And in, in Hebrew times, they had 30 days to a month. So that's the, that's the principle we follow when we're following the Hebrew literature here. <coughs> okay? So 70 weeks, alternatively, is 490 actual years that are cut off from the 2,300 years. So 70 weeks decreed for your people and your holy city. And what is to be accomplished in that time? To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity. Remember, this is done through the great atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the only way, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal both vision and prophet, the fulfillment of this prophecy to its accurate point is evidence, it is proof, that we're on the right track in interpreting the prophecy of the 2,300 days. And it confirms not just the, the vision, but also the prophet is from God. In fact, Jesus himself acknowledged Daniel as the prophet, didn't he? And it is also to anoint a most holy place. Now that's one translation. Um, the marginal note in my Bible, which is the New Revised Standard Version, I put it here, it says it can either be a thing or one. To anoint a most holy thing or to anoint a most holy one. That's why in some translations it will say to anoint the most holy or to anoint the holy one. In this case, to anoint a holy thing. In other words, it has a dual application. And uh, you can take it either way because whether it's anointing the holy place, the sanctuary in heaven, or whether it's anointing Jesus, the Holy One, the Messiah, that's what it means, the Anointed One, it both fits into the teaching of Scripture. And personally, I would accept the dual application of that word because both are applicable to the scriptures. And it, you know, either way, it fits, fits the account that the Bible gives us. So the Hebrew word kodesh, kodeshim, meaning something most holy or someone most holy, therefore has this dual application in both the heavenly sanctuary and of Jesus himself, who is our saviour and our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So then, the question now is, when does this 490-year period commence? Well, we don't have to guess. We don't have to get a pin and close our eyes and, and stab a calendar. So let's, let's pray the Holy Spirit will guide me at the right point. We're not casting lots. We are following what God has told us in the Scriptures. So the angel Gabriel came to explain to Daniel, he said, 490 years are to be cut off from the 2,300 years. And it commences, he says, Know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So the question is, when was Jerusalem and its temple restored? Remember, they were in ruins as a result of the, of the uh, sieges that Nebuchadnezzar had taken in his three invasions of Jerusalem. Uh, the decree would be given he says, to rebuild and to restore the city of Jerusalem. From the date of that decree, a specific number of years, namely 490 years, would encase the coming of the Messiah and his great sacrifice for us. In fact, he would come before that 490-year period was finished, as we shall see according to this prophecy. But it would also confirm the vision, the chazan, of the entire prophecy of Daniel 8, and it would confirm Daniel was the prophet that God had appointed. He was a true prophet. And thus provide us with the commencing date of the 2,300 years, because it's cut off from it. So when does this 490-year period commence? Well, in our Bibles, we have the record of three decrees for the repatriation of the Jews, and they're recorded in the book of Ezra. Uh, which is one of those books that you find just before the book of Psalms. You've got Ezra, Nehemiah, Job, and then Psalms. Okay? So here we have Ezra chapter 1, in the first four verses, is a decree of Cyrus, which was the first decree given in 537 B.C. Okay? 537 B.C. 
Then there's a second decree recorded in chapter 6, which comes later, during the reign of Darius I. That, don't confuse that with the Darius that followed Belshazzar. Uh, there's another one. This was later on, some 17 years later, uh, just soon, thereabouts, or soon after 520 BC. Then there was a third decree, the first 16 verses of chapter 7 of Ezra, which was in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And that is recorded in 457 BC. Now, those dates are based upon scientific discovery. The archaeologist confirms it from the materials that have been discovered, uh, can confirm that date. Now, out of these three decrees, the third decree that we put down there, 457 BC, was the only decree that gave the Jewish state full autonomy. The other decrees were decrees, they could go back to Jerusalem, they could start rebuilding it and so on, but it was the decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC that gave them the permission to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and to become a Jewish state in its own right. Still under the rule of Persia, it was part of the Persian Empire like other states, but it now was given full Jewish autonomy over its own state. So 457 BC is the right date. Now, let me share this with you. Any of you been to Egypt? You've been to Egypt? You've been to Egypt. Have you been down the River Nile to, to Aswan? Did you see Elephantine Island? It's a little island uh, right down there in the Nile. Uh, and um, if you look at it from a certain position while you're on the, on the river, it looks like elephants. The rocks are look like you know, a herd of elephants. Uh, I don't know if that's why it's called Elephantine, but that's what I assume. But Elephantine Island became a Jewish colony. Because you remember when Nebuchadnezzar finally destroyed Jerusalem and took the people back to Babylon. He didn't take everyone. He left a lot of peasants in the land. And he, he made Gedaliah, I think it was. Was it Gedaliah? He made as a, uh, what would you call him, a governor uh, under the rulership of you know, the, the Babylonian Empire, he was responsible to govern the people in that area. And there were peasants in this land who, to keep the land going and so on. And uh, he was killed by Ishmael. And this is not Ishmael, Abraham's other son. This is a later one, you understand. Some of these names are other people as well. And he was killed by Ishmael. And they said, we're going to go down into Egypt. In fact, they said, Jeremiah, who was still there, he said, Jeremiah said, should we go down into Egypt or should we stay here? And Jeremiah said, do what God says. God says, stay here. So they turned around. This is the attitude that they had, which shows how bad they had fallen. In spite of the words of Jeremiah coming true, and they'd witnessed it all, and they were privileged to be able to remain still in the land, they said, well, God says so, but we're going to go down to Egypt anyway. And so they dragged poor Jeremiah down to Egypt. And that, as far as we know, is where Jeremiah finally died with the rest of them. But this Jewish colony was formed on Elephantine Island. And there's evidence of that colony in the island today. And some archaeologists were rummaging around there on the island, and they, they tripped over some old crocodile skins. And they were stuffed with papyrus scrolls. Papyrus is a paper that they, they made from the papyrus leaves in Egypt and they, they, they took these scrolls out and they began to study them. And you know something? Critics had said that it's ridiculous what's recorded in Ezra chapter 6, uh, chapter 7, because no foreign king is going to turn around and say to the Jewish people, you go and worship your God and this is how you're to worship him give them the instructions to worship their God according to what God had said. No, ridiculous, these are heathen kings, they won't do that. So it shows that the Bible is, is just a bunch of fairy tale. Really. When these archaeologists began to read these scrolls, they discovered that they were confirming what the Bible said. That that is exactly what the Persian kings instructed. And what is more, the Scrolls confirm not only the record of Ezra, but they confirmed that the decree of Artaxerxes 
was in his seventh year of his reign, which is 457 B.C. Wonderful, isn't it? How the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the flood of, of falsehood that the dragon poured out of his mouth, uh, as the book of Revelation says, and God produced the evidence that gives us confidence in God's word. You know, when I've given a series of presentations on, on archaeology and the Bible, I've had people come to me so many times and say, thank you, thank you for confirming my faith in the Bible once again. I didn't confirm their faith. What confirmed their faith was the evidence that I shared with them. Thank you. Because faith had been destroyed by high critics and evolutionists and philosophers and humanists. Friends, God's word stands true. It stands true. So, know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem from 457 BC commences the 490 year period, it is also commencing the 2300 year period because it's cut off, remember, from that period. So what was to happen? Here it is. Know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 457 BC, until the time of an anointed prince, who's that? The Jesus. There shall be seven weeks and for 62 weeks. So that's 69 weeks. But he breaks it down into two sections. He says for seven weeks and for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and moat but in troubled times. So, let's take the seven weeks first. How many days in a week? I've got five on from my hand. I need another two fingers. Right, seven, seven, seven days. So that's seven prophetic days days, which is seven years, or 490 years, I'm going to get this right, 49 years, seven times seven is 49, 49 actual years, and then it went on to say that, well, from 457 BC, take off 49 years, you're counting backwards in time, BC, so that brings us to 408 BC, let's just look at it on the chart here, excuse me, it's slightly off the screen, I apologise for that, but 457 BC is when the decree of Artaxerxes went out that the city should be rebuilt and everything rebuilt and the nation was restored the full, um, full rule over its own, 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 own state. <coughs> know therefore and understand, it says. And so that 457 BC brings us down to the year 408 BC, which is here. But there's another 62 weeks to complete that 69 year period. So until the time of the Nunnant of Prince there shall be seven weeks, and then it says for 62 weeks, it, that's the city, shall be built again with streets and moat, but in troubled times. Now we know from the account in the Bible that when they went back there to rebuild, it was in troubled times. The Samaritans and others were trying to hinder and stop and, and uh, they were sending messages back to, 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 the, to, to the empire saying these people are rebuilding, they want, to dis they want to rebel. You see, and it was in troubled times. And so, 62 weeks, that's 434 days, prophetic days, 434 years. Let's move down. Uh, it says... 408, taking off those extra 62 weeks period, which is 434 years, brings us down to the year uh, A.D. 27. Notice we're moving from B.C. to A.D. time. Now, my wife always, always questions this, but uh, I assure her it is correct, and you can check it out. When you move from B.C. to A.D. time, there is no year naught, so you always add a year. Otherwise, you end up a year early. All right? People have made that mistake in their calculations. You would have come to AD 26 otherwise. There's no year note, so I, I can't explain. I'm no mathematician, but that's how it works. So it brings us to AD 27. So let's look at the chart. 408 BC continues the remaining period of the 69 weeks, or 483 years, which brings us to AD 27. 
when Jesus was baptized. Now, friends, in the prophecy <coughs> of Daniel 8, Jesus is referred to as the what? The prince of the host and also the prince of princes. You've got the verses on the screen there. He is the prince, but is also referred to here as the anointing of the prince. All right? So the word Messiah means the anointed one. In Greek, it's the Greek word is Christos, from which we have our English transliteration Christ, which means anointed one. The Hebrew is Messias, from which we have our English transliteration Messiah. One is Hebrew, one is English. They both mean the anointed one. So the 70, uh, the four, four, get this right, the 483 years, that 69 prophetic weeks, brings us down to AD 27 when the Messiah would be anointed. Was he anointed in AD 27? Well, first of all, let's just establish what I'm saying here from the scriptures. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, it says, when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, <coughs> suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And this is attested to in the scriptures, Acts 10, 38. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And it's by that that he went out healing the sick and casting out demons and so on and so forth. So Jesus was anointed when he was by the Holy Spirit when he came out of the water at his baptism. By the way, when it says he came up out of the water, that indicates he wasn't sprinkled or poured upon. He was immersed. You've got to be immersed to come up out, haven't you? So here we are. Now then, was that the 15, uh, was that AD 27? Well, it tells us here in the scriptures, in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. He was the emperor, the Caesar at that time. We know that Tiberius Caesar was enthroned in the year A.D. 12. We know that from extra biblical material. He was enthroned in A.D. 12, and it tells us it was his 15th year when John came baptizing, when Jesus was baptized. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work this one out. If you add 15 to 12, it brings us to A.D. 27. Jesus was baptized, and he was anointed, exactly on time according to that prophecy. Now, friends, I've run a number of presentations through my years of ministry, and sometimes when I've presented this prophecy, I've announced it, entitled it, Proving the Divinity of Jesus by Mathematics. You know, sometimes you like titles that captivate people's interest. It does prove the divinity of Jesus by mathematics, because accurately, he, he fulfilled every point on time of the prophecy said. We haven't finished yet, but I want to tell you there was a debate that broke out in Poland between the Roman Catholic theologians and some Jewish rabbis. Now, I forget, I think it was in the 17th century. I, I, I just need to check that date, but it was early on. And the debate was over whether Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. The Roman Catholics believe he, he, he is, and the Jews, even today, don't believe. They believe he's a good prophet, but that's all. So this debate went on, and finally the Roman Catholic theologians presented this prophecy I'm showing you of the 70 weeks. And when they finished, the Jewish rabbis broke up the meeting and they went into a private enclave, and when they came out, they refused to discuss any further the matter and they pronounced a curse on any Jew or anyone who should dare study and try and compute the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Now, why did they do that? Because they could see that this prophecy was evidence. It proved that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Well, I haven't suffered that curse as yet. And I've been teaching this now for many years. 
So, dear friends, Jesus was baptized exactly on time. But that's not the end of the story. We move on. Let's move on. It says, after the 62 weeks, now how, how much time is left? The 69 weeks gone by, 7 weeks, 62, 69, and the 70, that's one final prophetic week left, which is seven actual years. Yes? You with me? All right, so after the 62 weeks, after AD 27, in other words, an anointed one, because he was anointed there now, the Messiah, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Now, what does it mean to be cut off? Well, the Bible gives us the answer again. Isaiah, I love to use the Bible for the answer. It's the safest way. It says in Isaiah 53, the Messianic prophecy says of Jesus, he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And what, what was to be fulfilled in this period? That very thing, to deal with the transgression. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. And sometime, therefore, after AD 27, Jesus was to be crucified. When? Well, the prophecy is even more accurate than that. We've got 70 weeks. We've had 69 of those weeks, which leaves one week left, which is seven prophetic years, uh, seven literal years. So, sometime after AD 27, during that final period, he was to be cut off. Well, it also said in verse 27, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week, now some translations say in the midst of the week, so how, how far along is that? Seven years? Half a year? After seven years is three and a half years, right? In half of the week, he shall make sacrifice and of offering to cease. What does it mean to make sacrifice and offering? Remember what we talked about this morning, the sacrifices of the sanctuary. They pointed towards what Jesus would do when he came and died for us. Well, the record tells us that Jesus cried with a loud voice and breathed his last, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom brought an end to that sanctuary service because he fulfilled what God had promised and was ratified. So one week, the seven prophetic days or seven actual years from AD 27, in the midst of that week, from the autumn of AD 27 to the spring of AD 31, was three and a half years. That's when Jesus died. And three and a half years later, brings us to the autumn of A.D. 34, the time when the gospel went to the Gentiles. So there we have it, in a nutshell. It confirms the prophecy. Here we have it. 490 years, that period of time, from 408, uh, 457 to 408, and then on to A.D. 27, when he was anointed at his baptism. Then, in the three and a half years later, he died for you and me, and of course he rose again. And three and a half years later, the gospel went to the Gentiles. So, as the angel said to Daniel, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. That's not the end of it. The anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, that happened, because the Romans came in the Jewish wars, and it was in AD 70, when that sanctuary was destroyed and it's never been rebuilt. There's a mosque stands on the, on the sanctuary platform today. In fact, two mosques. There's the Mosque of Alster and the Dome of the Rock. Two different mosques. It, its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war. And he goes on, desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week he shall make sacrifice and offering to cease and in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decreed end is poured out upon the just man. And so he answered, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. 2,300 years, less the 490 years, brings us to the year 1810. We're now in AD time, remember, 1810. 
So, dear friends, 1810, if you add it on to AD 34, so we just entered the 490-year period, where does it bring us? 1844. Very significant date. <coughs> and he said unto me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, translate that into its literal period, 2,300 years, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. As we point out this morning, the Day of Atonement, known as the Yom Kippur, is known as a time when the sanctuary is restored or the sanctuary is cleansed, is the meaning of these words. Uh, there's the text again, the sanctuary shall be cleansed, which is the King James Version. Other versions will use like restored or put right, but it's talking of the same thing. And the day of judgment is the day of cleansing. It's seen as the day of restoration, of putting right, of reconsecration. And so 1844 is a significant date. Let me read to you uh, from what is the Jewish encyclopedia concerning the Yom Kippur. This is how the Jews see the Yom Kippur. It says, God seated on his throne to judge the world, at the same time judge, pleader, expert and witness, openeth the book of rec records, it is read every man's signature being found therein, the great trumpet is sounded, and a still small voice is heard, the angels shudder saying, this is the day of judgment, for his very ministers are not pure before God. As a shepherd mustereth his flock, causing them to pass under his rod, so doth God cause every living soul to pass before him, to fix the limit of every creature's life, and to foreordain its destiny. On New Year's Day the decree is written, on the Day of Atonement it is sealed, who shall live and who are to die, etc. But penitence, prayer, and charity may avert the evil decree. That's from the Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 2, under the article of the Day of Atonement. To the Jewish person, the Day of Atonement is the Day of Judgment, a day of putting right. And so, dear friends, you can see on the sundial of Earth's history, we're swinging around from 457 BC, when the decree went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, right through to the time when it, that prophecy is confirmed by the fulfillment of the 490-year period and the remainder of that prophetic period of time, because that 457, which not only gives us the beginning of the 490-year period, it gives us the beginning of the 2,300-year period too, which brings us to the year AD 44. So what is significant? <coughs> Remember the sequence of events that took, are listed in Daniel chapter 7 that uh, we have looked at, we looked at it this, uh, last week, we looked at it this morning, I think we looked at it the week before. In Daniel 7, in the vision that he had, as he was given that, that, that vision of history enlarged through those four beasts, first of all, you've got the four winds beating on the Mediterranean Sea, and as a result, the four great kingdoms came up out of the sea. Babylon, represented by the lion, the Medo-Persia by the bear, the, the leopard representing the empire of Greece, and then that nondescript beast representing the Roman Empire. And that beast had ten horns, and out of, uh, amongst them came this little horn that uprooted three of those horns, and that little horn became the defiant one against God. It spoke great words against God, it persecuted the saints, it cast truth to the ground, it defiled the sanctuary. And then it says that after the little horn had come on the scene, the judgment was set in heaven. And the nondescript beast and the little horn were put to death and Christ comes having received his eternal kingdom. Here it is. We skipped through the words this morning. I'm going to read them now. Daniel 7. As I watched, this is his description following the little horn. As I watched, thrones were set in place. An anointed one took his throne and his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence, and thousands, thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The glorious scene here in the heavenly assizes. It says, The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. 
And I watched, said Daniel, that then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the, uh, the, the horn was speaking, and as I watched, the beast was put to death and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. But he says, as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. As we know, Babylon was succeeded by Medo-Persia and that was succeeded by Greece and so on. Their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now, I understand that to mean, in my, in my reasoning, you may uh, agree or disagree with me, but I understand that to mean that the influence of their pagan and cultural practices passed all the way down from Babylon through these successive kingdoms into Rome, into the Roman Empire, and then into the Roman Church. And, uh, you know, some scholars have done research and they have found that they can search, they can trace back a lot of these customs back to ancient Babylon. For instance, the College of Cardinals that selects the Pope. They dress in red, they go into private conclave, and you don't see them till the white smoke goes up the chimney, right? The Babylonians did something very similar. Sprinkling came from the Mithra bull. And even before that, which was Persian, even before that in Egypt, archaeologists have found in the temple of Queen Hatshepsut a priest sprinkling a little a baby's head with water from a little bowl in its hand. You see, friends, these pagan influences have passed through. Their lives were taken away, but their influence carried on, uh, as it say. Anyway, the, pro the judgment is set. And he says, as I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. This is not the second coming of Jesus. This is Jesus coming to the judgment. And as he came to the ancient ones and was presented before him, to him was given dominion and glory and kingship. Jesus now comes to receive his kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingship, one that shall never be destroyed. Christ comes to receive his kingdom so that when he comes the second time, he comes to collect his subjects who have been prepared to meet him. Does that make sense? He can't come as the king unless he receives his kingdom. And so in the typology of the Old Testament sanctuary, there where the great truths of that sanctuary have been cast down to the ground and it's been defiled by the, the falsehoods and the, the counter-teachings to the salvation of men, God has fulfilled that in Jesus Christ. He's the sacrifice on the altar of Calvary. He's the high priest who enters into heaven. And when the judgment begins, he enters into the most holy place. In other words, he enters into the second place, into the second phase of his ministry. He's still carrying out his daily representation for his faithful people. He's not preoccupied now with something else but he now enters into the second phase where he comes before the ancient of days and he receives his kingdom. My friends, it's so wonderful to know that Jesus is my personal representative in heaven. And it's so wonderful to know that my life is safe and secure in him as long as I remain with him. No one can pluck me out of his hand, but I can choose to leave if I so wish but I don't wish. I want to be with Jesus. Friends, let me explain to you something here. The judgment comes in three phases. The first phase that we have is the pre-advent phase of judgment. That's the judgment before Jesus comes again. It's sometimes referred to as the investigative period, but we'll call it the pre-advent phase because it places it in a point in time previous to the second coming of Jesus. Then there's a second phase of judgment known as the millennium phase of judgment. And then there's a thir third phase which is described in the book of Revelation as the judgment of the great white throne. That really is an executive phase where God ultimately consummates everything. So, the pre-advent phase of judgment begins in 1844. And I can tell you now, Seventh-day Adventists are the only people that can tell you when the judgment began. That's a fact. Because of the prophecy that we study here. The pre-advent phase of judgment began in 1844. It will continue just before the second coming of Jesus. 
So the second advent, Jesus will come at the end of that phase. Then we enter into what the Bible calls the millennium phase, where this earth becomes a desolation for a thousand years. The saints are in heaven, the dead are all, uh, the wicked are all dead, and Satan is there to roam this planet as the goat of sending away. You know, and he wanted to be God. Well, God created this world in six days. He says, if you want to be God, I'll give you the materials. And at the end of a thousand years, he can't even tree one, provide one blade of grass. He can't bring those bodies to life. Maybe he'll deceive them at the end of the thousand years, says, I raise you to life. Come on, we can take this city. But it says, we come then to the judgment of the great white throne. And it tells us in the Bible that every knee shall fall down and acknowledge that God is right. You see, we ask the question, why? Why does God want the judgment? Does God not know? Of course God knows. He's omniscient. He knows out of this congregation here today who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. I hope it's that he knows nobody's going to be lost. But he knows. But he gives us all the opportunity. This isn't for God's information. Don't forget, God is also on on trial. He's on trial before the entire universe. Lucifer brought accusations against the maker. And God has to handle this. If God destroyed Satan there and then in the beginning, people were saying, be careful, don't step out of line. You remember what happened? You go in a puff of smoke as well, you'll be vaporized. No. God had to demonstrate that his character was not what Satan made it out to be. And he could only do that by showing his love and forbearing with us. And in so doing, he has put a a complete revelation of what evil is, too, in contrast. Satan has been shown for what he is. And so, this is not, the pre-advent phase isn't for God's knowledge. It's for the unlooking universe, the unfallen world, to see that God is right. Because they want the assurance when when Jesus comes again and sets up his eternal kingdom, that it's going to be a safe place. And then what about the millennium? What's the point of that period? Well, the Bible tells us that we shall, the saints will be engaged in judgment. We will even judge angels, it says. The fallen angels. What about, you think, well, I I expect to see Aunt Lizzie here today in the kingdom. Why is she not here, Lord? Well, I didn't expect to see this bloke, but he's here. And God will reveal the reason so that we will be satisfied that God has done what is right. And then what about the executive phase? For whose sake is that? You know, this is what I like about God. He's so transparent, he's so open, he's so fair, that even those who are going to be lost will be shown why they are lost. And they will acknowledge that he's right, but they won't repent, because they will still be led by Satan to try and take the city, and that's when, as you know, The Bible says God will bring fire down from heaven and destroy them and he will make a new heaven and a new earth wherein will dwell righteousness. Three time indicators to show us that we are speaking the truth here. Right there, first of all, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 17, he says, Understand, O mortal, that the vision is for the time of the end. The time of the end, dear friend, 2,300 days brings us to the year 1844. And the prophecy in Daniel 7.25 tells us that the little horn would reign for a time, two times, and half a time. Do you remember? I explained that to you. The 1,260 years from the decree of Justinian, 538 brings us to 1798 when Napoleon took the Pope prisoner and brought an end to the Holy Roman Empire. That marks the beginning, virtually, of the time of the end. And the prophecy says, then, after that time, after the uh, the 1260 years, then, it says, the court shall sit and the judgment would take place. Well, 1844 is soon after 1798, is it not? Secondly, The angel said to Daniel, it refers to the appointed time of the end. Well, we've just seen that, that as 
Paul says in Acts 17, he commands all people to repent because he has fixed a day. That's not 24 hour period, that's a period of time. He has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man, that's Jesus, whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So he has fixed a time when he will do it. And the third point is that the vision of the evenings and the mornings, he says, refers to many days from now. In Daniel's day, it did. Way down in the future. 2,300 years plus beyond. And so, it concerns the evenings and the mornings, it concerns the distant future, says the NIV. When it discerns, so 1844 from 583 or 538 to 537 is many days or the distant future from Daniel's time. These are three indicators concerning the accuracy of this interpretation. And so it refers to the time of the end, to the appointed time, and to the distant future, many days from the time of the end. Three tenses also to underline this truth of what we're saying. In the 6th century BC, that's when Daniel was giving this prophecy. Judgment was a future event. As we've just seen, it was for the distant future, many days from now. In the days of the Apostle Paul, in the first century AD, where was the, pro uh, where was the judgment then? Felix sent for Paul and heard him speak concerning faith in Christ Jesus. And as he discussed justice, self-control, and the coming judgment, was judgment past, present, or future? Future, the coming judgment. It was yet to come. King James Version says, the judgment to come. The coming judgment's future. Felix became frightened. So the judgment was also in the future, in the first century. But when we come to the 21st century, in which we live today, the prophecy in Revelation 14, that is God's final message for these last days, John says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. This is when God's message is to go final in its warning to the world. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world for witness, and then the end shall come. And so he said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Is that past, future? or present? It's present. It has come. It has arrived. And so, dear friends, we're talking of a current event right here and now. Can you see why it's so urgent? You see, as it tells us there in Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus comes again, he describes it that the sky vanished like a scroll, rolling itself up, and every mountain and island were removed from its places. Then the kings of the earth and the, the magnates and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, people from every realm of society, they hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? My friends, that is the searching question. Because in order for you and I to stand, we need to be ready before that door of opportunity closes. We need to be ready now. As I said this morning, if we were to die today, our personal door would be closed. We are sealed for eternity, whether we're lost or saved. So we have seen in the historical event fulfilling these prophecies of Daniel, that ordinary human beings and rulers and kingdoms were given a probationary period. And the Bible teaches that every human being, that includes you and me, will eventually, uh, our probation will eventually close and it will come just before Jesus returns in glory. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me this. Right at the end of the book of Revelation, it says there in chapter 22, verses 10 to 12, he said to me, this is John now writing, he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. That's interesting, isn't it? 
Daniel was to seal his words up because it wasn't to be fully understood until the time of the end. Now, he says, the message for these last days, don't seal it, broadcast it. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. That's a declaration. In other words, if you're lost, you're lost. If you're saved, you're saved. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. So Jesus isn't coming immediately. Man's probation period closes, but he comes soon after. We'll deal with what happens in that period of time in our last presentation in two weeks' time. So the only way, dear friends, that you and I can stand acceptably before God is explained here in the Bible where it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the city, into the city uh, through those gates. How do we wash our robes? In the blood of Jesus. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's by accepting Jesus. Washes whiter than snow. For all of us must appear, says Paul, before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are where? In. Let me hear that. For those who are where? In Christ. You can know about Jesus. You can follow what he says. But if you are not related to him, if you don't have that close relationship with Jesus, you are not in him. Those who are only in Christ are the ones who are saved. And it says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why not? Because Jesus is our righteousness. He clothes us with his righteousness. We are told that love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, what is Jesus? He's sinless. He's righteous. As he is, so are we in this world. That means that when God sees me in the judgment, when I am in Jesus, he doesn't see me as I am with my sinful nature, he sees me as though I have never sinned. Because Jesus has taken my sin and paid for them. And that also applies to you as well. Isn't that wonderful assurance? To know that we're accepted as he is. And again, there is no fear in love, he says, because perfect love casts out fear. So fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We don't need to be afraid of the judgment, friends. The judgment is something for the believer to rejoice in, because it's to know that in the judgment, God is not only putting things right as far as bringing truth back to the fore, so that people can understand and get ready for the coming of Jesus. It also means that Jesus is my representative. He's fighting my corner, and Satan may be fighting against me, but Jesus is there as my righteousness, as my victor, and I can have victory in him. And so we don't need to be afraid of the judgment. It's something to rejoice in. Judgment isn't always there to condemn. It's also to vindicate. And so we love because Jesus first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars, it says. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, it says, cannot love God whom they have not seen. For the command we have from him is this, that those who love God must love their brothers and sisters. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, we're not unhappy that we have to keep them. We want to keep them because they are right and we want to do what is right. Because we are converted, we want to do what is right. For whatever is born of God conquers the world and this is the victory that conquers the world. What is it? It's our faith. Our faith, dear friends, in Jesus that conquers the world the one who believes in the Son of God. It's our victory in Jesus. Jesus said, it is I, 
Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the, cl- for the churches. I am, not, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. Remember we read that from Peter right on at the beginning of this series. You will do well, he says, to be attentive to this, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Dear friends, the judgment is in session. We don't know when it will close. God does. He hasn't revealed that to us. But when it closes, the Bible says there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. We might feel the draft blowing through at the present time. But that time is coming that has never been witnessed on this world before, the Bible says. And only those whose faith is firm in Jesus, trusting him, will be able to stand that experience. It's up to you and it's up to me to make sure that our relationship is right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you like to say yes with me? I'm going to put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus so that I will be ready when that day comes. If you would like to do that, I'm going to ask you if you would stand. And I'm going to ask our pastor if you would come forward, pastor, and offer the prayer on behalf of all of us. If you want to join with that commitment, don't stand if you don't believe it, but if you really want to make that commitment, then let us pray together at this time. Let us pray. Lord, we uh, thank you that we do not need to fear uh, the judgment throne when we are in Jesus. We praise you for that. And that you in your love and your mercy and your grace has made that possible for each one of us. Mm. Lord, help us to live in the light of that great mercy and grace that you have given us. Uh, These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.